do you, uh, when you have a situation like this and you approach a, let's say, a, a shooting call, uh, you presume that's the only one, right? Normally you would, yes. Yeah. So then when they start happening elsewhere, it, it's not automatic, though, that they're connected, right? No, but the minute that you have a second one, everybody kind of thinks maybe it is. And then when it is confirmed, then that just puts everybody on high alert as to it's it happened twice. The likelihood that it's going to happen again is very high. Mm -hmm. And what can we do to find this and stop it before it does happen again? Yeah, and that has to be a challenge when you don't know where that's going to be. That's why every little bit of information that we get from then on is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Joel, you know, this was unfolding. You probably heard about it at some point uh, near or afterwards. As a person whose livelihood centers around firearms and firearm safety and so on, what, what goes through your mind when you hear things like this? No, the first thing that occurs to me is that firearms are a tool. They're neutral. They're neither good nor bad. When in the hands of the right people, they're a tool for good. And yet in the hands of a wrong person or somebody that's intent on doing evil, they can do a lot of evil with it. The problem is, is the only person that's going to stop that guy is somebody else with a firearm. That's why we call police. Mm -hmm. The problem with police is they're kind of heavy. Chuck's a big fellow over here. I can't carry him on my back. Yeah. I can't carry him with me. I can carry the firearm. Um, it's, a, it's a last resort. It, it's, it's one of those safety measures that I have with me. But, you know, I don't think my house is ever going to burn down. Sure. But I've got smoke detectors and a fire extinguisher in there just in case. Mm -hmm. If I knew there was something that was going to cause my house to burn down, I'd do something to prevent it. Awareness and avoidance, that's what we teach in class, is to be aware of your surroundings, to avoid things whenever possible. The problem with a situation like this is, is it was completely random. At this point, we don't even have really a reason. And even if you did, what reason would make that okay? Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of reason that I could give you for why this guy did this that you would suddenly go, oh, okay, I get that? There isn't. Yeah. For this kind of evil, there just isn't. And so it behooves us as citizens to not be so engrossed in ourselves and our own worlds and our little electronic worlds and staring at our phones. And when we're out in public, understand that bad things can happen anytime, any place, anywhere. And to be more aware of our surroundings and to identify where we can escape to if something bad happens. It's sad that we live in a world that requires that of us. But until we can get back to a society that tends to be a bit more moral and a bit more respectful of our fellow citizens, we're going to have to survive reality. Officer, would you say that uh, a fair amount of the gun-related calls that that you see are like uh, Joel describes, someone who could be out of control with a firearm? It's not that anybody could be out of control with a firearm. Anybody can be extremely safe with a firearm. You don't know what you have until you're there, until you see it or until you get information about what's going on when you get there. So just because a gun's involved doesn't make it a bad situation. Because a gun's involved could make it a great or extremely safe situation. It's, it's who has the gun in their hand. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes the difference. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. 840. 16 WBCK in the studio with us this half hour. Battle Creek Police Officer Chuck Palfrey and Joel Fulton from Freedom Firearms. You know, both of you have, have uh, made an assertion that the world isn't what it used to be and that uh, our country is different than it was. This is, I've, I've seen this posted now, in excess of 40 uh, gun-related shootings in the country since the beginning of the year, which this is February 23rd, not even two months. What do you think is going on here? Uh, are, are we? What is it about our society that seems to foster this kind of um, outburst, this kind of um, violence? Either one of you, whoever wants to start with that. Violence is something that you just sometimes you can't predict. You don't know who's going to do it. It seems, and you know, it's just an opinion that now people have less respect for other people, less respect for other people's property, and even less respect for themselves. Is that and the U.S., or is that the world? I live in the U.S., and that's what I pay most yeah. attention to. Right. I can't, well, right. can't really comment on what's happening in other countries because I don't live it and I don't know, but here this is what I see. And the more of that 
lack of respect and lack of pride that we see, the more we see people that are infringing on other people. And that's what we see. Violence is violence. People use a gun for violence. If they didn't have a gun available, they'd do something else. If they want to do violence, they're going to do violence. If they want to do harm, they're going to do harm. And if they're going to find a tool to do it with. That would suggest to me, then, that your job is harder than it used to be. A lot harder than it used to be. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Joel? I've seen assertions that the problem with the United States is our gun culture. Well, the gun culture has been here since our founding. So in over 200 years, the guns have always been here. So that can't be the problem if it's only changed in the last 40 or 50 years where we've gotten more and more violent. So the question is, what's changed? And what I think has changed is the foundation of our family unit. What I think has changed is how we train and teach our children. What I think has changed is that we are inundated with violence in our society, whether it be violent media in the form of television, movies, violent video games, but constant violence, violence, violence. And it, desensitizes. at a very young age, it desensitizes. And you're talking about small minds that are not formed yet. Their brains are not fully developed. They can't handle that when that's all they're getting. Now, I'm not saying that's the sole reason. What I'm saying is, is when you inundate them with that, but yet you don't guide them with moral foundation. In other words, they don't have parents in the home that are giving them good moral foundation. They don't go to church. They don't have civic organizations that they're involved with, like Boy Scouts or any one of a number of things that would give them a moral foundation what we're doing is we're doing the same thing we do with military in the military I have to teach you how to kill you will not automatically kill it's not natural for people to do this I have to train you how to kill to keep you safe on the battlefield but when I give you that operant conditioning the same kind of conditioning by the way that you get in violent video games when I give you that operant conditioning I protect it with social conditioning in other words I give you rules of engagement I give you, you only do this under certain orders. The problem with the violence is, is we take these kids and we use the TV and all these other things as babysitting tools, and we don't give them the moral guidance they need. We don't protect that operant conditioning with the social conditioning required for that. And instead of being 18 and 19 years old where I give them the operant conditioning, I'm doing it down here at 5 and 6 years old (laughs) where they can't deal with it. And then we wonder why we're training little killers and why all of a sudden it becomes more permissive to do that kind of violence when I get angry or to use that as conflict resolution rather than what wholesome good violence should be used. Because there can be good violence. I use it to meet bad violence. Sometimes Chuck has to get violent when he's out there on the street Mm, because he has to stop a criminal. Mm -hmm. And that's good violence. So, uh, Chuck, when we talked about... uh the kind of situation that the Kalamazoo County authorities were dealing with on Saturday night. It so happens that the situation started in the northeast part of the county and went southwest. It's possible that it could have come this way. Was was there an alert to local law enforcement to be ready in that case that happened? I don't know that anything went out as far as alert, I know I know that our officers on the road knew about it. Yeah. And I knew that they were watching venues of, uh, you know, people coming in. There was a vehicle the description city. out oh, there, there probably. There was a vehicle description. Yeah. I was off that night, but I was at home watching thing, everything on the news, and my phone was with me. And I was waiting because, you know, it was, it's not beyond us getting a call going, hey, everybody's coming into work, right. and we're going to send some people over there to help. So uh-huh. I, was, I was by my phone waiting to see if that call was actually going to come out. Sure. But uh, everybody gets ready. Well, back in just a minute on WBCK 823. WBCK in the studio with us now, Batter Creek Police Officer Chuck Pelfries with us and Joel Fulton from Freedom Firearms. So I want to try and get to a number of things here before we're done. Uh, Officer Pelfrey, I just want to give you a chance. I don't know what the advice possibly would be, but do you contemplate these situations with which uh these folks dealt with over the weekend uh, i'm not sure what kind of safety advice there is i mean they were essentially ambushed if that situation happens you can presume that you have split second to react somehow if at all right that's why cowards ambush because they don't want to give anybody the opportunity to fight back and that's yeah. what this guy was he was just the ultimate coward and he ambushed people in a place that he knew or figured that they wouldn't be able to fight back. 
the biggest thing is an awareness. You know, the more you are aware of everything that's going on around you. But if you look at you know, some ladies sitting in a car talking and just got done having a meal, they're going to be talking and paying attention to themselves and not, not the things around them. And that's what he was looking for. He was looking for that perfect victim. And that's, that's what a coward like that looks for. And that's what they found. Especially in the uh, dark. You, you be aware. You know, somebody asked me, well, if one of those people in the car had a gun, would they have been able to stop him? It's possible. I can't say yes, can't say no, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. So we know that they weren't able to. I presume it also depends on how well trained they are with that gun, right, Joel? It certainly depends on how well trained they are. And again, you're talking about an ambush situation. You're talking about somebody that's intent on doing violence and evil. My question is, is where were the bystanders? Where was anybody else around? If you're putting yourself in a situation where there's, there's potential for that, I like to stay moving. I don't like to sit in a car. Mm -hmm. I, I like to be on the move. I don't like to put myself in situations where I'm vulnerable. And we don't think about that because we're trusting of our fellow citizens. We like to have faith in our fellow human beings, and I understand that. I get that. But unfortunately, we live in a world where there's evil and there's violence out there, so I try not to ever put myself in a situation where it can come up on me. One of the aspects of this, too, um, is the uh, the whole Uber connection here, and now that's under some level of scrutiny. Do you hear about a lot of calls regarding Uber drivers or passengers? It's not an Uber driver situation. Yeah. It was an evil person who just happened to be an Uber driver. It has nothing to do with Uber. Uber's not any more dangerous today than it was last week. It wasn't an Uber thing. It was that was a very violent person, and he just happened to be an Uber driver, and that's the venue that he used. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's interesting because I have always thought about the the taxi cab situation from the other way. The driver just rolls up, and somebody gets in the car. You don't know who that is, what they have, what their intent is. This obviously was the reverse. And but. the same, in the same token, it's not a gun thing. Yeah, it happened to be an evil person with a gun. Guns are no more unsafe or terrible last week than this week. They're good. They're still a wholesome product used for personal defense over and over again. In fact, far more for personal defense in the United States than they ever are used for evil. We have about a minute left, but uh, I want to give both of you a chance to answer this question. Some folks out there have said, what can we do to try and mitigate these kinds of situations from both of your perspectives what do you think folks could do evils out there you're not going to be able to prevent evil from happening you can stop it quicker and you can avoid it and that's the biggest thing set yourself up so that if it happens to you you can protect yourself against it and set yourself up so that you're aware of everything that's going on around you so that you can avoid it joel you essentially need to adopt a warrior mindset Awareness, avoidance, always pay attention to what's going on around you. A warrior mindset where I will fight back if evil comes against me. It is far better to be a warrior in a garden than it is to be a gardener in a war. How do you do that? I mean, you know, here we're talking about ladies in their 60s and 70s. Uh, is there a warrior school you can send people to? <laughs> I mean, I, how do you do that? I, honestly, when I train for concealed carry, yeah. I teach awareness and avoidance. I'm, I'm constantly inundating people with being aware of your surroundings, walking upright, paying attention to what's going on around you. All of these things that we train for because that's the focus, more than the use of the firearm, because you're likely, hopefully, never going to have to use that if you're aware of your surroundings and avoiding situations that could cause you problems. And I have people of all age groups and demographics, black, white, yellow, green, purple, anywhere from 21 to 99 taking my class. Okay. It doesn't take a lot of strength to squeeze a trigger, and you've still got a brain. And that's your most powerful tool of self-defense. Pay attention to what's going on around you. Well, and if we've heard anything the two of you have said, that was it right there. Be observant and be looking for things that don't look right and be ready to prepare yourself to act somehow. Thanks to the both of you. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Officer Chuck Pelfrey, Battle Creek Police, and Joel Fulton, Freedom Firearms. 820.